back with Isaac, and we got a, a very trenchant observation. Hey, NL got tricked into buying a $7 orange juice at a diner. Any tips on how to recover? Um, well, don't buy Starbucks for like the next year is the only way. It's going to, you have to amortize out that loss over a very long time scale. Um, but I, I've long said this and I apologize because I know that if you've been around for a while, you've heard it before. Brunch and breakfast juice prices are probably the biggest scam on the planet. They know they've got a captive audience. They know that it's it, like the culture did all the work. Every cereal commercial ever, you have orange juice with your cereal. You got milk with your cereal. You got a glass of water. You got two slices of bread. You got scrambled eggs. You got three breakfast sausages. It, it, the culture has made everybody think you have to drink orange juice for breakfast. So they can charge whatever the hell they want uh, at brunch. And they know you're going to pay it because probably the main reason you're at brunch in the first place, if it's not for the eggs, Benny, or the French toast, is for the orange juice. Especially if you happen to be hung over when you're going to breakfast. You'll pay whatever they ask. But I, uh, I'm, I've long been a, a water uh, for breakfast sort of guy. Because nothing disappoints you more than you go to a, a, a diner for breakfast. You order an orange juice. It's four or five bucks. It's not fresh squeezed. It's just like Tropicana or Simply Orange or whatever. And then it comes in a cup that's like literally this big. It arrives 25 minutes before the food because all they have to do is pour it out of the Tropicana carton. And then there's no free refills because apparently it's, it's precious like liquid gold. All right. Now there is a, there's a caveat here in my personal world. I will gladly pay a premium for freshly squeezed juice because it tastes so much better than the non-freshly squeezed stuff. So if you give me the choice between like paying $5 for Tropicana or like eight bucks for a freshly squeezed, I'll, I would much rather pay the eight bucks for the freshly squeezed because at least there's like some merit involved with it. But otherwise, it's it's like the biggest scam in the entire uh, on the entire menu, as far as I'm concerned. Those were good pills. You know what? They're in the curse room. If they weren't in the curse room, I would go back and I would test you. Wait, are you willing to put your chat life on the line? You willing to put your uh, your chat life on the line now that we have placenta? Yes, I am. Okay, you're lucky I don't remember your username. So far, so good. You gotta be feeling good after that one. Kudos to you. Subpar1224. You, you left your life on the line? What are, the, what are the odds of two good pills in a row in Isaac? That's gotta be like one in a thousand. That's crazy. No, you don't get VIP'd for that. Come on. Have some standards. I'd be hard-pressed to pay eight bucks for any drink in a restaurant that's not a cocktail. I do have to acknowledge that there, there's like a Canadian-American um, exchange difference. And then there's also... You, you willing to go triple or nothing? I would, I would describe that as not good, but not bad. Also, we got a planetarium. Venus, health up. Charm enemies. You know what? Sure. Let's just grab this. Two of hearts. The world. Pop that. Dude, this is a great start. Um, holy shit. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> My god. Um, what I was gonna say is... Uh, there's a, there's a, if, if you're watching this like 45% of my audience, if you're watching this from the United States of America, for restaurant prices, you have to add like 25% for the US to Canada conversion. And then you also have to add like another 10% on top of that, that's irrespective of currency. It's just that, you know, things tend to cost more up here. And then you got to add like another... 15% on top of that for the Vancouver tax of, of living in, uh, you know, a, an expensive city. So, just thinking. Just thinking. 
Work with me for a minute here. Like an $8 cocktail is something I've not seen in, in a long time. I, th I feel like the average cocktail price that I see on a menu in Vancouver is probably like, it's like $13.75 now. It's getting a little crazy. Maybe, maybe at a happy hour, but I'm, I don't tend to be at those establishments between like, you know, 4 and 6 p.m. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but we have a baby. Dr. Manhattan pointing at uh, Rorschach. We have a baby. I would say like eight, eight bucks is about what you would expect to pay for either a, a pint of beer or alternatively like a, a smoothie or a, like a freshly squeezed cold pressed juice or something like that. Why not? Teleport me? Come on, dude, you can give me, teleport me? Soul heart? What a slap in the face. I should not have picked this up, obviously. I don't want... I'm just... Just don't die like a fool. I can step on it one more time. And I got my eternal heart anyway. Okay. And don't walk on it again. That could have been a disaster. Same with DC and NYC. Average drink in a non-dive bar is like 15 bucks these days. It is crazy, but I, I mean, I understand that it's partly, you know, inflation. And then it's partly, you know, the restaurant industry went through the ringer like the last couple of years. But it's got me, I never thought I would become like my grandfather. But I definitely have become my grandfather. Because I remember there was a, in college, there was a bar that opened up near campus. And on Tuesday nights, they had $2 beers. It's crazy. Now, the, the concept of a $2 beer is unfathomable. Like, it, it might actually be below the minimum pricing legally allowable. The economy, folks. The economy? The economy? We still have $2 Tuesdays where I'm at. Honest question. Do you live in the state of Wisconsin? I work at a restaurant where the cocktails are 30 bucks. Okay, do you work at an insane cocktail bar where they use one of those like liquid smoke um, machines and the, every cocktail has like 17 egg whites in it and stuff like that? It's made by like a guy who looks like Stanley Tucci. He's got muscular forearms and he's got like a, a really tight roll up on his sleeve and then his forearms are like veiny and busting out of the rolled up sleeve and he's going like... Or do you work at one of those insane places where a, a, a cocktail is 30 bucks, but the catch is it comes with like three hamburgers on a skewer served alongside of the drink. You work at Dorsia. Oh, okay, that explains it. I mean, that's just, that's supply and demand. That's, that's market pricing. move to Pennsylvania where Yangling comes out of your tap. Here's, I, I've only been to Pennsylvania. I mean, I've spent like six days total in Pennsylvania. Some of it was in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. Some of it was in uh, Pittsburgh and the surrounding suburbs. My question to, to particularly Yinzers in the chat, okay? Yingling is good. So why are you guys drinking so much icy light? You, you were blessed, and it's very rare to be blessed with, like, a, a good macro brewery that's local to where you are. So why are you replacing the Yangling that you're blessed to have in the first place with IC Light, which is just, like, I don't even understand what it's doing there. Yangling is from Philly. IC Light is from Pittsburgh. Yeah, but come on. Like... You guys are more similar than different, right? I mean, only one of you throws batteries at your own NHL players when you're disappointed with their performance. But still, like, apart from that, you you both like to eat at Primanti Bros, right?
We threw batteries at Santa Claus once. Philadelphia is so funny. Why is it called the city of brotherly love? That's hilarious. You threw batteries? At, it, it, it's actually almost worse. Like, to throw batteries at a real Santa Claus, you would be like... You know, I, I'm re-rolling Eden's soul, by the way. We could do better. If you throw batteries at real Santa Claus, he's like a mythical creature. He could dodge them, he could weather the storm or whatever. You know, he's, he's gonna be fine. He has, like, eldritch powers or whatever. But that, you know that's just a dude in a suit. You're just throwing, you're not throwing batteries at Santa, you're, you're just throwing batteries at, like, a guy. That's just assault. In Philadelphia, a dude also ate horse crap to celebrate the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. Look, unfortunately... Let's go. Uh, unfortunately, I am not able to um, criticize the way that any city has reacted to winning or losing a major sporting event. So... I, uh, in, I abstain. I recuse myself. I will say, I would not eat horse crap. Maybe this is the, the recent poisoning talking. If you were like, if you ate one third of horse crap, the Canucks would guaranteed win the Stanley Cup next year. I wouldn't do it. I would be like, you know what? There's more important things in life. It can't be safe and sanitary. I mean, if, if just to be completely like 100% with you. If you were like, hey, we'll give you the same food poisoning you just had, you'll get over it in like five days, but it'll guarantee that the Canucks will win the Stanley Cup, I wouldn't do it. It's just sports. It's okay. I don't, I, I, it really took it out of me, man. That's why I'm so stunned whenever there's people who like actually honor those deals that are like, you know, if the Rangers lose, I'll get uh, Tampa Bay rules tattooed on my ass. And then they actually do it. I'm like, dude, you gotta like just delete your account. You gotta run away from that one. It's just, you're really gonna get a tattoo on your ass for the Eastern Conference Finals? It's not even the Stanley Cup Finals. You're doing it for the Eastern Conference Finals? Like that's, that's too much. I just, I, I shouldn't read the comment, but I'm going to read it. Commenter said, I'm so happy to have a two monitor set up, porn on one monitor, NL audio on the other. I don't even know what to say. I feel like that's going to lead to some very confusing, like, knock-on effects in your brain. I'll take it, man. I personally think there should be a, a separation of church and state. He went full Philly? What? I, I'm not insulting Philadelphia, okay? I have nothing wrong with... In my head, I have no preconceived negative notions about Philadelphia except the fact that they uh, threw batteries at that mall Santa Claus or whatever. It's not like they're Minneapolis St. Paul. completely different situation. No, thank you. They were just snowballs. They weren't batteries. Were they... Was it like, oh, there were the batteries were inside the snowball, so they were cushions? I do have to tell you, by the way, there's probably some people in the chat who, um, you know, maybe they grew up in an area where it never snows. The media did a, a heck of a propaganda job when depicting how fun a snowball fight is. If you've always had like FOMO that you never got to experience a snowball fight, I'm here to tell you it's, it's not all that. Come on, man. I, we can do better than this. We can do better than this. Like the, a snowball fight, it's, it's one of those things It's fun for like 
The, the first time you throw a snowball and you hit somebody with it, you're like, this is fun. The first time you get hit with a snowball and it explodes on... Because the thing is, it hits you like in the side of the cheek or something, and that's fine. But then the snow like particleizes and it shoots down your winter coat like under the neckline of your t-shirt and it gets down your back and stuff like that. You're walking around the rest of the recess like this, like with your shoulders hunched up like this. Or it gets in between your, your snow pants and your boots and stuff like that. And that's even, like, that's the best it ever gets. Because what you always end up with, like, some kid whose dad just got out of, like, federal prison or something like that. Who gets off on uh, making, like, an infinity stone snowball. Like, he makes a tiny little snowball in his hand. And then just, like, holds it like this for a minute incredible patience for a, a little kid to have so it becomes like an ice ball then you put a little bit more snow around it so it like it refreezes and then so they're basically just like hucking golf balls at you man hide some gravel inside of it i'm you know a snowball fight is one of those it's fun for like 10 seconds plus it's so hard to make the snowballs in like a, a winter glove or a, a mitten. So then you take your gloves off and then you're like, your hands are cold for the rest of the recess. And you're like, well, that's why you're, wear you're supposed to be wearing the gloves, I guess. Oh, dude, don't even get me. When, when someone would like scoop up a bunch of snow in their hands and then another person would pull back like your, your jacket and shirt and then they just dump the snow right down your back. Ugh. I still, and this is not like a kids these days bit, but, you know, I, I just think back to like some of those recesses we had in elementary school. It would be like minus 20 outside. We'd go outside for 40 minutes for recess, begging the teacher, like, please, God, can we stay inside? It's so cold. They say no. And I don't blame them because I'm sure that the teachers, you know, they want their own time to eat their lunch or whatever and just be like away from the kids for a little bit. It's kind of crazy. I feel like nowadays it's like a human rights violation. There should be like an... It, during... When the weather's like below minus 10 degrees, they should just put you in the gym with a bunch of board games or something like that. It's too much. Did you manage recess ever when you taught? No, because I taught at a, a, like a private school in Korea. Kids would just come for like one or two classes and then they would leave. So they, they weren't there for eight hours a day. They didn't need the recess. But I did ad administer a couple uh, field trips. I took, I took kids to uh, a, a local art gallery once. I took kids to like, the, uh, like a science museum once. Honestly, like, it gave me a lot of respect for for teachers. Because as a kid, you don't really get it. But being, like, one or two teachers and having to look after 30 kids is crazy. No wonder they have us using the damn buddy system and stuff. Like, I, I, I did not get to enjoy the field trip at all. I spent, like, the whole time just trying to make sure I didn't, like, lose a, a child. It's okay if you lose one or two. That's the thing, right? You would think, like, nobody's perfect. So it's like, come on, 30 kids? I lost one. 97% of the kids made it home. 97! No matter where you are, that's an A+. But, oh, the, the parents of the kid who got lost at the science museum and their kid ended up traumatized, they don't see it that way. They get real perturbed about it. Those parents had a 100% loss of their child. No, in the bit, they just had to go to the museum and they just got scared for a while, okay? I have, I, I don't think I've ever told this story, but I have an embarrassing story about myself. Um, when I was a, a little kid, I was in Future Shop with my grandpa 
And I was like playing, I don't know, Metroid Prime on their GameCube uh, setup or whatever. My grandpa was probably looking at like USB cables, I don't know. Um, 20 minutes go by, I say, okay, you know that little kid anxiety starts to creep in where you're like, uh, where's my family? Where's my family? Um, I started to freak out. I was like, I, it's time to go find my grandpa, right? I walk through the whole future shop, don't see him. Walk through the whole future shop, don't see him. Starting to panic. The more you panic, the less you're able to actually like, you know, search very well because you're just overwhelmed with emotion. Then I went up to the customer service deck. I was like almost in tears or desk, I should say. Um, I was almost in tears and I said, Excuse me, I think I lost my grandpa. Can you make a call for him on the PA to come to the customer service desk? And they did, and he was literally like 10 feet away. But the most embarrassing part of the story is not that he was close, is that I was at the, the age that I was when this story took place. You probably thought I was uh, like five, I was in the damn eighth grade. <laughs> Too, def looking back, definitely too old to be that perturbed at, at having lost my, my grandfather in the future shop. What does that mean for non-North American people? I was like 13. Oh, man. Yeah, sure. Still just a kid, yeah. And like some kids at 13 are like, you know, living on their own. Some kids at 13 are like, I don't even say swears. But I, I was definitely, I guess I was closer to the second than the first. Yeah, I knew it was kind of a puss move even as an 8th grader. Like, I was embarrassed with myself, but... Yes, I had hair then, for sure. That is, and it always... Why did I even walk back, man? You know what? Why did I should have come in here first? I guess I'll take seven seals. Um, it's crazy for me to think of because, like, that's where I was when I was thirteen. And uh, sometimes you'll you'll read like a comment on Reddit that's like, "Oh, I started drinking when I was twelve. and I'm like, "You consumed an alcoholic beverage when you were twelve years old. I didn't even eat soup when I was 12. I was such a picky eater. I had my first drink at 13, 15, 11. So the other, I guess the, the aside of this, the, the flip side, I should say, of this story is that I turned 12, or I was like 11 or 12 when the millennium happened, when Y2K happened. My parents were like, you should have a glass of champagne. And I like almost called child protective services on them basically i was like you want your 12 year old child to consume champagne i'm 12. i refused they were like it's a special event you should like you know feel free to you know you just have a sip or something like that and i was like i will not have a sip and quite frankly i'm disappointed in you but then i i feel like Again, this is just plus two farming, so I apologize because it feels like it's it's too easy. But um, North America's like relationship with alcohol is like really bad. Because you're like taught that you should never touch it uh, until you're 19 or 21, which is actually like 21 is crazy. So what most, well, I shouldn't say most, but what many people end up doing is they spend like, you know, 20 years with the, the mystique surrounding alcohol. Like, oh my God, this must be something that's like, it, it must be like an elixir of the gods. And then when you actually start drinking, you make up for lost time and go crazy. That's why like, there's the college stereotype of the, the kid who was never allowed to drink in high school, and then, like, the first year of college, they're throwing up, like, every four days. Not everybody fulfills the stereotype, but... But it does happen. Not me, OMG me. There's dozens of us. 
I still remember my first alcoholic drink. There was a very wealthy foreign exchange student in our dorms in university. And he said, do you want a drink? And I was like, yeah, bro, obviously. Been, been drinking it for years. And then he mixed me uh, like Goldschlager and something else and said it's called a Dr. Pepper because it tastes like Dr. Pepper. And then I drank, it was probably like seven liqueurs in a shot glass. And I drank it and I was like, that's great. That's so good. Let me guess, it did not taste like Dr. Pepper. It did not taste like Dr. Pepper, which is fine, but... Like, 19-year-old kids do be doing that stuff. They'll be like, Dude, I, there's all these like weird myths about alcohol. Like the snake bite. It's a strong bows or a Magner cider mixed with a lager in equal parts. It's illegal to serve it at bars in England because it gets you too drunk. It's Jägermeister and Goldschlager. It's called liquid cocaine. I don't know why I'm doing it like iced tea from Law & Order SVU. Equal parts, Goldschlager and Jägermeister. Kids on the street call it liquid cocaine. Gets you so high. It's a John Mulaney joke, isn't it? I think I, I think I just stole a John Mulaney joke. Jameson and ginger ale. Kids these days are calling it a Scotch bonnet. Already picked up two bodies this morning. It is indeed a John Mulaney joke. Okay, sure. Hey, I do have to say, I, I've i talked a lot about like um, Netflix comedy specials that I have not enjoyed recently, which is almost all of them. And apparently the new thing for Netflix comedy is um, instead of green lighting 50 minute sets that people actually like write and stuff like that, instead um, they just have like Snoop Dogg Pick like nine comedians and then the comedians go up and do like three jokes and then they go and next it's Michelle Wolf and she comes up and does like three jokes and then the, it's like a, it, it, it's not good. It's not to my, to my preferences at least. However, I watched the new special from comedian Joel Kim Booster. I would give it the seal of approval. I don't, I believe it or not, I don't think I want to, uh, I don't think I want it. Maybe we'll re-roll it. I thought it was very good. This is the first thing I'd ever seen him in. I didn't know, I didn't know any of his other work and I was like, uh, this, this is a humorous set of stand-up comedy. Why are you only doing Isaac runs? Um, because my enjoyment of Isaac is in a very delicate position right now, and I feel like, um, the best way to ensure that I have fun, and then that, uh, hopefully, like, the audience has fun as well, is to just play as Isaac and, and do the, the best that I can do as a result of, of that, and just, just enjoy the game, rather than needlessly putting roadblocks in my way that give me a, a false sense of merit, having, you know, oh, look, I le I, maybe I lost, but at least I lost playing as Tainted Samson. Like, who cares, man? Who cares? Like, the whole game is variety to begin with. Who cares about the character, man? No thank you? Why not? You think Eden runs are too much Zane? Well, you have to consider what Zane is. You know, is Zane... Um, like, I'll take things that are not necessarily objectively good. But as a result of that, like, we get some entertainment value out of it. Because that's how I always thought Zane is. And then it turns out that, like, based on the way that the game was rebalanced for Repentance, Zane is when you get no damage, no tears, and no HP. But you have, like, a familiar that goes, wow, wow, wee wah, every time you get hit. You, you get, like, Little Borat or something like that. I told you, I don't want this. That sounds fun. Yeah, that's the, that's the textbook definition of Zane uh, now. 
for whatever reason. Soul of Lilith. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. Lil Borat, I mean, he's a pretty good familiar. He's a cool dude. He's kind of like... Borat's kind of like Grogu. In my opinion. They're just like cool little guys. Hey, Anel, at the grocery store, do you bag your own groceries or wait for the cashier to do it? It's a great question. Um, I'm not afraid to say that, like... I honestly, I, I don't believe in many conspiracy theories, or any maybe, but I do think that somewhere down the road, or down the line, grocery stores used bringing your own canvas bags to the grocery store as a way to no longer have the grocery store bag the stuff for you. I don't remember what temperance does. And don't get me wrong, it's nice to... Five random pills? I mean, I do have PhD. Um, it's nice to bring your own reusable bags. But if you weren't alive in the 90s, here's what a grocery store experience was like, okay? You put your stuff on the conveyor belt, it gets scanned. You, oftentimes, there was a person at the end of the conveyor belt that worked at the grocery store that bagged the stuff up for you. And I know you're going to say, oh, a uh, big man needs to uh, have someone bag his own groceries. I can bag my own groceries. It's just going to slow down the damn throughput for the lineup of people behind me. Because I got to also put the shit on the conveyor belt. And then I also got to pay. And then I got to wait till the card reader says approved. And then I got to put my card back in my wallet, my wallet back in my pocket. And then I got to go to the end of the conveyor belt and start packing up this stuff myself. So you're actually going to serve customers more slowly than if you had somebody like helping out at the back but anyway so at some point we started bringing reusable bags you hand your bag to the cashier the cashier bags it up um while you're paying that was not so bad i didn't really mind that then i remember and and i mean you got to be careful with your covid rants don't get me wrong but i remember it's probably like May 2020. I went to the grocery store with my reusable bag and I put my reusable bag on the end of the conveyor belt in order to, you know, you want it to be standing up nicely so you can just put your own stuff in the bag as quickly as possible. And then the cashier like scolded me and said, sir, thanks to COVID, it's against store policy to let your to let people who bring their bags from home put their bag on the counter. Like, with that, we were at peak hysteria. Like, it, it was... Even when, when I was at peak hysteria as well, I was like, you know, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, not to be rude, but you think the bottom of my bag has COVID on it? It just, I, I guess maybe there's not an, an appeal to reason, but still. And then I'm, my, my bag is going to give COVID to the counter. And then somebody's going to lick the counter. And then they're going to get COVID or I don't understand. But anyway. And then they just never brought it back. So, and I'm, I'm not knocking the cashiers, you know, they got... It's, it, they, they were frontline heroes, you know, during the lockdown. But nowadays, the way that it seems to go is they say, how will you pay? And I say on card. And then they look up at the lights of the grocery store. Well, I frantically bag my own shit as haphazardly and quickly as possible so that I don't feel like I'm being watched by the 25 people in line behind me who are all going, ha, ha. I miss the dedicated bagger, man. You woke up my hamster? You gotta put on Bluetooth headphones, man. 
As a cashier of seven years, I love those moments. Like I said, I'm not mad at you. I mean, I don't really think that the cashier should have to bag the groceries. I think there should be a dedicated bagger. Especially, I honestly, I'm happy with my spirit arts here. I'm, I'm leaving. I think there should be a dedicated bagger, personally. It's just the, it's the superior system. Like, why are we paying... It's, it's not like we're paying less for groceries because there's no bagger. Have you looked at your grocery bill lately? It's crazy. Oh, thank you. I know, I'm, t I, I'm on to you, Daryl from Save On Foods. Daryl! Spending all your money on Save On Foods, million dollars, score and win. If a Vancouver Canucks player scores nine goals in a single game, you'll win a million dollars. Hey, Daryl, how about you stop financing this nonsense and you start having someone staff the bakery so I don't have to stand at the bakery with my thumb on my ass for like 20 minutes waiting for somebody to uh, show up so I can be like, yes, I'll take two hamburger buns, please. How about you just hire some people, Daryl? It's madness. Savon is overrated. Come on, I don't know anybody on earth who likes Savon foods. You just, you know, you kind of tolerate it. People like the real Canadian Superstore. People like, you know, some of the stuff at Whole Foods, despite the price. Nobody's like, oh, I'm so excited to go to Savon. It's just like, that's where you go when it's... It's the closest grocery store to your house where, like, a loaf of bread is not $20. Costco, people love going to Costco. I don't think anybody's excited to go to Save On Foods. Save On charges you extra for not giving them your data. It's actually true. Is a hundred percent correct. Um, I know it sounds more insidious when you put it that way than what they would place it as or what they would describe it as. But basically, if you Go to a save on foods, prices will be listed as like um, member price, and it'll it's very tempting because the member price is oftentimes like 30% less than the, the non-member price. But in order to get the member price, you basically have to give them, you know, your, your phone number and your email address and be advertised to and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I hate to say it because, I, I mean, I'm a member as well. The juice is worth the squeeze. You do also get to, um, you get to collect save on points. But I'm here to tell you, so I, I've been using my Save On More Rewards card since 2015. I, so we think about five years of grocery shopping. The net gain I've gotten out of More Reward Points, I've probably gotten, I would say like five, eight packs of sparkling water. And a couple of loaves of bread. So you're, we're, we're talking about, I don't know, like less than $10 a year in, in actual rewards for having this card. I did buy that lady bread once accidentally. Not bad. You're actually like hail corporate. That's terrible. That's probably like 0.1% cash back. What do you mean not bad? It's not bad. It's awful. It's terrible. Your food data ain't worth that much? Bro, are you Daryl? I don't understand. You, you want me to get down on my hands and knees and, and thank Daryl for giving me one case of blackberry sparkling bubbly over the course of eight years? I'd rather die. By the way, Daryl, 
Just hire some more cashiers. Maybe the lineups at your damn store wouldn't be so long if you just hired, like, you know, two more people. I just don't understand all the people that are like... Look, I have nothing but respect for the grocery store workers, and I have nothing but contempt for the grocery store owners. Don't even get me started on Galen Weston, man. Ten years of, of oligopolic collusion to fix the price of bread in Canada to raise uh, Loblaws' uh, profit margins. Class action lawsuit between them and the Canadian citizenry. Total settlement, $20 gift card for anybody affected over the course of 12 years of bread price fixing. It's comical, man. Get owned by the bread mafia. Bimbo International. Look at this, man. Imagine thinking that was Mayor Pete. Honestly, there should be like a button you hit. I, like on Twitter, on any form of social media that just filters America out. Did you see the tweet that was like, the internet's broken. There's no reason I should know the names of 75 American congressmen when I live in Amsterdam. Like there, there needs to, be, and I, I apologize to the United States citizenry that's watching this. Again, you're the plurality of the, of the viewing audience. You don't understand that as a result of your hegemony, the whole world basically becomes the United States of America. They're really just like, there should be light mode, dark mode, and then like no America for a bit mode. You should be able to like hit a button and then any American tweets get filtered for like just 24 hours. And then I, you, a lot of people are saying based, but also... If you ever find yourself on the West Coast waking up at like 5.30 a.m., you realize that like overnight Twitter is just American Twitter but with British people instead. I also should not know that many like British councillors and, and members of parliament and stuff like that. In a just world, I would have no idea who uh, Jacob Rees Moog is. I should not know. I, sh I should... One in eight people in Canada should know the name of the British Prime Minister. There needs to be like a... There needs to be a button that's like, just turn this off. Just for a day. I'm not saying Americans shouldn't be able to tweet. There should just... You should be able to like, shield yourself for a day. Drop the left hand. Ancient meme and yet also so true. Thank you. Thank you. It's Mugen time. Apparently it's Jacob Rees Mog. I'd like to apologize. But again, there's no reason that I should know that. I don't I think Quince is okay, but whatever. Don't worry, Elon's gonna save Twitter. I'm looking forward to it. I think he's got a lot of good ideas. What is, what's the first, the edit button, right? I don't see how that could possibly go wrong. I'm, I'm very staunchly against the edit button on Twitter. I'm not saying there's no way to fix this problem, but the way that I see it working is that somebody makes a tweet that's like, I like pizza, and then thousands of people favorite it, retweet it, reply, and go like, I also love this, I agree. And then the original poster edits the tweet to say, like, I love murder. And then everybody that replied, all of a sudden, it looks like they have a, a permanent record on their uh, Twitter account of liking murder publicly. But also, I just think that, like, we should accept that, like, typos are gonna happen, man. Who cares about a... T like, it, does it seem a little archaic to have to delete a tweet and repost it because there's a typo. Yeah. Okay, so just leave the tw just leave the tweet up there. Who cares? It's just Twitter. 
On Tumblr, you used to be able to edit other people's posts. Now that's a choice. That's an idea. Kofefi. So true. I can't wait for the 10-part Netflix series on Kofefi. Okay, e easiest run of my life. The sanest Isaac run on Twitch. Slash marker. That'll be TBOI1.